Welcome back, everyone. October 20th, 2020, exactly two weeks before the election. I woke up early this morning and I was watching COVID pundits on CNN. And that's a sort of new form of punditry, punditry but they are, as most of you know, academic leaders in public health, infectious disease, and health policy. And I was watching one that you've probably seen a lot, Peter Hotez, who's at Baylor Medical School. He's an expert in pediatric infectious disease. And I couldn't help but note how sober and discouraging his assessment of where we are in the pandemic was this morning. And he presented a narrative that is becoming much more common that we're moving into a very serious and dangerous time for the pandemic in the United States. And I know all of you have been following this when you start to see 50, 60,000 new cases a day, over 500 deaths a day, and a rise in hospitalizations, which may be among the most important data points, you realize that we are heading in many ways, as many people are saying, here in the US, but also probably in Western Europe, in the wrong direction. And it made me reflect on something Ingrid and I said at the first day of the course, that we would be studying a moving target. And I think for all of us in academic disciplines and approaches, we'd like to hold something fairly stable and try to study it and understand it even if we recognize that it will be changing. And even for a historian like myself, we often look to the past because things have stabilized in a sense that we can understand um, the context and change that takes place. So among the things I was thinking about, and this is highly relevant to today's discussion, is we do have tools for mitigating the pandemic and eventually we'll have better treatments and eventually, I think, we'll have a vaccine. But those tools have been deployed in erratic, haphazard, and often very limited ways, often in highly politicized ways. So today we'll be looking at one of those tools in a larger social and political context, a tool that was raised very early. And when I think, what are the tools we really have most of them are human and behavioral. Some of them involve a technology like testing. We've had the at least possibility of testing since very early in the pandemic. And finding cases, isolating those cases was offered early as one of the potentially best strategies for limiting the suffering and death associated with COVID-19. So we'll be looking at the application of one of the available technologies. We already talked about masks, that's another one. But it's interesting that these pretty clear technologies that offered considerable positive hope in the pandemic in its early years have been so difficult to fully implement. So we have a brief poll and then I'll turn it over to Ingrid to introduce today's speakers. We were interested to know if, how many of you have contact tracing software on your phones? Well, these will inform our discussions today. I think I would have said, and I'll be very interesting and interested in our panelists' view, that in March, I thought, most of us would have uh, contact tracing apps on our phones by the fall. So that's really interesting. And I certainly will certainly be addressing the issues of privacy and naming contacts. So let me turn it over to Ingrid. Thank you so much, Alan. And we are just so thrilled to have three tremendous leaders with us today to really discuss the role of testing and tracing as a, a critical public health strategy. We're going to ask, and I assume this is generally the case, no tweeting, um, 
you know, social media blurbs of what people are saying today. Um, there's a lot here that overlaps with a lot of complex political and social issues. And we wanna make sure that this stays a safe space for people to discuss that. So I'm, I have the great pleasure of introducing our three phenomenal speakers. First up is Professor Danielle Allen, who is the James Bryant Conan University Professor at Harvard and the director of the Safra Center here for ethics. Uh, Professor Allen is a political theorist and she's published broadly in democratic theory, political sociology and the history of political thought. And she and her team at the Safra Center have been really leaders in examining the political and ethical issues associated with the pandemic really from its earliest days. And she has led um, nobly a bipartisan group of experts across the fields of economics, public health, technology and ethics to really create the nation's first comprehensive operational roadmap for mobilizing and reopening the economy in the context of COVID in this whole framework of the TTSI structure. So we'll be eager to learn from her today. Our second speaker is Dr. Georgie, who's, the, who's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Global Health Equity and in the Department of Medicine of Brigham and also an associate professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. And she also wears the hat of chief medical officer at Partners in Health. And the role of Partners in Health has been absolutely critical in leading the Massachusetts response for contact tracing. And again, Partners in Health generally works globally. And I think what's so unique about this moment is that Partners in Health has drawn on its global expertise in their response, for example, to the Ebola pandemic in West Africa, and also its commitment to serve the most vulnerable populations of the world to ensure that there is a just and equitable response here in Massachusetts. So we're really excited to hear from Dr. Mukherjee about her experience here in Massachusetts and, and globally. Our last speaker is Professor Jonathan Zitrain, who is the George Bemis Professor of International Law at the Law School, a professor at the Kennedy School a professor of computer science at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and perhaps most importantly in this role, the co-founder and director of Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And Professor Zitrain has really been a leader in thinking about ethics and government governance around AI and the battles for control of digital property. And I think today's poll really speaks to the fact of a lot of concern about privacy issues. And he and um, our former speaker and a few sessions ago, Dr. Margaret Bordeaux, uh, who are co-chairs at the Berkman Klein Center have led um, interesting discussions around the digital pandemic response. And so we're very excited um, to have Professor Zitrain here. So on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Professor Allen to kick us off. Um, we'll pass it on now to Dr. Mukherjee to carry on. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And, you know, it's an honor to be on this panel. I appreciate being invited. Um, I am a practitioner of social medicine, and I am going to um, talk really about what Partners in Health has done with COVID, not only in Massachusetts, but around the country. We're working in cities like Newark, Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, also in communities like Immokalee, Florida, and states like Illinois and Ohio. Um, and it is, as Ingrid said, informed by, um, informed by our uh, global work. So I think one of the reasons I bring up the idea of social medicine is that pandemic preparedness, the notion of it is rooted in a set of concepts, including prevention, detection, rapid response. Um, there are natures of conditions, whether or not a state is prepared, what actually constitutes preparedness, what ought and ought not to be funded. 
And then I think the question I have as a public health professional, a social medicine practitioner is, what is the validity of what we know about pandemic preparedness? What's been codified, what's been written about, what's been taught? And so here I'm showing you the Global Health Security Index that was published in two, at the end of 2019, developed by Hopkins, the Nuclear Threat Institute, and the Economist Intelligence Unit. They input factors from WHO, financial analyses, and health system status. And this is the pathway that was promoted by the Academy, essentially, by public health experts as the pandemic preparedness framework. And remember, this was published just as COVID was kind of breaking out of Asia. Um, in this uh, framework, they put the United States right on top uh, in pro pandemic preparedness. Uh, and I think it's really worth thinking about uh, where the US is, where other countries are, and what does that mean as we go forward? And my slides aren't advancing. Oh, so here you have Belgium kind of in the middle of the pack, the United States right at the top. And here is the nation of Rwanda, a nation I know quite well and, and we'll talk about a bit uh, at the bottom. So there's something about this framework um, and what's known and whether or not it's valid that has not really been critiqued. And um, I'm not gonna go a lot into social medicine theory, but I think if we don't understand the US through a lens of critical race theory and black feminist theory, we can't can't really fully understand the political economy of the response. Um, and so by critical race theory, of course, I mean just understanding and challenging the structures of racism and harm that we have in this country, what the social construction of race has done to maintain white power, and the intersectional methods we need uh, and where interests converge. Uh, in terms of black feminist theory, I think the notion of opposite, oppositional voices and centering our relationships in care. Um, and then of course, the political economy of this response, how political and social theory intersects with the monetary power and economics. Um, I won't go into that too much, but just to say I was once in another lifetime an engineer, and I always think of social medicine with this engineering diagram of forces. Forces, uh, we often in medicine call these the social determinants of health. I prefer to call them forces because they have a magnitude and a direction. And just as determinants might sound fixed, social forces can be remediable. And so what we see with COVID is um, the difference between control of the pandemic and chaos is really related to these social forces. The biologic, social, and political forces are tipping us into chaos. If it were just a biologic phenomenon alone, that all countries would be the same. And we know that is not the case. So that we have to interrogate the social and political forces to fully understand. And we believe at Partners in Health that the mitigating forces, the social medicine approach is really care, equity, trust, and leadership. And that is how we have based our contact tracing around this notion of accompaniment, um, touching people, being on the streets, being close. Uh, so because of our global work in um, contact tracing, we were asked by the governor of Massachusetts at the end of March to help stand up and scale across the state an army of case investigators and contact tracers. But what we said was that there was no way to do contact tracing in a vacuum without really interrogating the social forces that made it so difficult for people to quarantine and uh, isolate safely. And so we put in a, a third cadre we call the COVID care resource coordinators. And that is where we try to address to the extent possible the political economy. Um, our COVID care resource coordinator cadre expanded across the state and now is being adopted by other cities and states across the country. The current COVID care resource coordinators in Massachusetts speak 23 languages, are experienced uh, professionals in social work, nursing, psychology, et cetera. And they work with lo local communities to actually look at the path of illness and wellness walking with people. 
accompanying patients in their journey, whether they're people who are just exposed and need to quarantine, or whether they're people who are indeed sick and need to isolate. And what we've found with, so everyone who has um, a case, we enumerate their contacts, then a contact tracer calls a contact, and then after giving the information, the cognitive information, these are the things you need to do, says, can you do it? And the can you do it question is really trying to address the political economy, the structural racism and violence of our United States. We have found with this can you do it that up to 12% of people in Massachusetts need food support. 12% of people in the richest state in the richest country in the world need food support. Many people need housing support. We've worked with the Healthcare for the Homeless organization. We've worked with um, a lot of local organizations, food pantries, mental health expertise, et cetera, even uh, anti-detention work to try to make sure that the people who are on the front lines of harm, who are largely communities of color, poor black and brown people whose essential work is not fairly compensated, they don't have necessarily sick leave, um, and respond to that. So our care resource coordinators have done things from delivering diapers to finding people shelter. And if you don't have that link, you cannot address the social dimensions of this pandemic, which are profound. So I'll just wrap up quickly uh, by saying, uh, for example, our work in the city or the community of Immokalee, Florida, it's a town which is largely migrant workers who are undocumented, but the uh, rate of positive tests is 40%. And these workers do not get sick days. Uh, the state is actively trying not to test them. So our work there, and this is our Partners in Health team alongside the Immokalee Coalition of Immokalee Workers and people from the Department of Public Health, has tried to forge an alliance to have contact tracing be around care. That is the engagement of people from the community through the coalition. Equity, working with Mission Penial, which is a, um, a, a religious organization in Immokalee to provide food support, mental health support, social support, building trust with the Department of Public Health, and really trying to coordinate with allies, even though at the at the state level, Immokalee is in the state of Florida, which is one of the most reactionary states in terms of COVID, we can always find allies. And so in Immokalee, we have found allies that can promote this kind of leadership. So I would say in conclusion, contact tracing is important, but if we don't rethink the concept of pandemic preparedness away from inputs, in a system, but without the basis in care and solidarity, we will continue to have this chaos. And so we have worked to really focus on health as a human right, deliver equity and address vulnerability as a way to bring people in. And I think there is something about uh, contact tracing, uh, as Alan has pointed out, that historically has been penalizing, has been difficult. Um, and so in, in an effort to keep uh, to time, I'll stop there and just say that our contact tracing is really rooted in care. And as uh, an HIV doctor for more than 25 years, I can say there was once a time where people considered adherence to HIV to just be opening the bottle of the antiretrovirals. But we know over many years of activism that um, that great groups like Housing Works, that legal uh, 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 attention, that food support, all of these things are what have allowed us to address um, address the, uh, the AIDS pandemic and indeed will allow us to address COVID. And I will just say that in Rwanda, from day one of the first case entering into the country, to day 30, Rwanda was able to contain the epidemic to 134 cases. In that same first month, the state of Georgia went to 4,400 cases, same population, much higher level health system in terms of inputs. 
and the nation of Belgium, same population, went to 7,400 cases. So um, Rwanda has led with care, providing food, support, housing for people who needed to be in quarantine and isolation, a strong national leadership, and they are in a much better position today. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. I think this notion of leading with care, I think is something that's so critical. And I think both something that you and Professor Allen have discussed is the critical need for partnerships that are cross-disciplinary. It can't just come from one place, but it has to come from so many different groups of people who are invested in the care and well-being of the entire person and, and population. So thank you both. I will turn it now to our last speaker, Professor Zittrain. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you both professors Katz and Brandt for convening this course. And um, I'm just sorry I can't be a fly on the wall for the whole course as I look over the syllabus. And I just wanna point out even so far as we've heard from our colleagues, uh, professors Allen and Mukherjee, that within academia, I think across methodologies, there are approaches that involve trying to take a hard problem and break it into constituent parts so that they can be kind of cornered and analyzed and dealt with, kind of a solve the problem in front of you way of looking at things both intellectually and um, if one is action oriented. And there's also a tendency to want to see the big picture that if one focuses too much on, you know, leaves, you miss trees and you might even miss a whole forest. And uh, th that tension, I think, plays out in this area for a session that we want to have on contact tracing. There's both a desire to want to say, okay, contact tracing, how do we make contact tracing work? What is it, how, what's not working with it? What would it mean to make it work better? Kind of break it down McKinsey style. And then there's also, as you can hear, a uh, this kind of, plea for us not to look at things in isolation and to say contact tracing is not some mechanical thing that you crank through like a Taylor assembly line. It's part of an integrated set of problems that require an integrated set of solutions that go very deep and very fundamentally into our society. And if we're not going to attack them at the root, it's going to be hard to, to make progress. I just want to point out that tension as all of us are trying to kind of uh, pitch in on this problem. The other tension is one of uh, the long game, which academics should be particularly good at, not just responding to the problem of the week, but building theories and modes of analysis and collecting data, looking out for the long term, uh, which surely is important here. And of course, this isn't the only pandemic we're going to have. And I don't know, just as 500 year floods are happening every five years, if 100 years is the right metric on pandemics to have to contend with. And in that sense, COVID-19 is just the, the edge of the wedge rather than, uh, you know, if we can beat this, we can go back to uh, things as they were. Uh, so the long game versus the sense of urgency that I'll bet you are hearing as I am in our colleagues' voices and an urgency perhaps coupled uh, with for many of the people um, uh, that have been in the public sphere about this, with just a sense of amazement that even kind of the low hanging fruit has not been seized. I heard in Professor Allen's story, a sense of how methodically and carefully she and her team have been working to try to line everything up so that policy decision makers could as painlessly as possible, and regardless of their nominal, is there a D or an R or something else after their names, make something happen. And even despite that, I mean, the story of the uh, uh, things coming out on the same day, and then what impact that had politically and what it meant about the art of the possible is a really cautionary tale about the limits of a policy analysis in a classic academic way and a world that I imagine uh, among uh, uh, those of us who are students that we would think, all right, let's just get this right. If there's something that could make everybody better off, surely we would do that. And then coming up against a political reality 
And I, I can tell quickly a similar tale to the one that Danielle told of a kind of personal narrative of getting involved uh, in this area, and in particular in contact tracing. And I, my first involvement was like, all right, we know that you know Domino's Pizza and Farmville and anybody else that can make an app on your iPhone or your Android basically has the keys to the kingdom. At some point, you know, in order to play the game, you clicked OK and you decided to grant your location within two meters <laughs> accuracy constantly, even when you aren't playing the game to these app makers. That's, that's a problem. We've all written about that. But all right, for once, this could really be useful. We could use this to figure out how to deal with the problem of over the past two weeks, whom have you been near and how quickly measured in hours could we be in touch with them to assist them in processing the fact that they might have been exposed since we're presuming that patient zero has say a positive test result or presenting with symptoms that they can then uh, uh, quarantine and we could do some contact tracing to see who they've been near and maybe even go back and figure out super spreader events, et cetera, et cetera. That just seemed like surely so. And it's not just Domino's or Farmville, Facebook in uh, I think something that is not well advertised. I'm not sure I could find a public source for this, which is why I'm glad we're uh, off the record, but Facebook has the ability, in fact, uses the ability to know who has been near whom for years as Facebook. And I mean, you know, there's always, how do they know to suggest a friend? <laughs> well, this is how, part of how they know how to suggest a friend. The political economy of coming forward with that and saying, but now we're ready to use that to be helpful here, absolutely a non-starter. And you know, not totally irrational from a limited self-interested point of view of Facebook to realize that if they were to say that, they are concerned whether now or three years from now, that they'll be pilloried for what they're already doing because they have those abilities. So when a public health crisis of almost, you know, textbook proportions, this would be a classic hypothetical. <laughs> Should Facebook step forward and do this, eh, they're going to take a pass on that. So uh, we quickly found that our effort to see if the data already used to grease the wheels of commerce could be used to assist in the public health task of figuring out who's been exposed to whom and how to help in quarantining so that uh, you don't have a spread uh, of uh, the disease, uh, that we quickly fell back from that to simply, all right, what are some much more limited things technology could do to help? And uh, I don't know if today is to be the day in which it's discussed uh, or if you've covered it previously, the so-called GAIN, Google Apple Exposure Notification System, was those companies' attempts to say, all right, we're gonna try to be helpful, but in a way that will not expose us on the privacy side. I think they really are concerned about being hit on privacy more than they already have, certainly for Google, less so for Apple, which has made a bit of a name for itself in being privacy respecting. But in order to maintain that name, they started from the axiom that they don't want to know location, that that's too sensitive, and that they don't want to have a database of people's names, and that they'd prefer not to have a database of people's names even in the hands of public health authorities, et cetera, et cetera. If you start from those axioms, rather than a holistic point of view that says, uh, uh, Professor Allen invoked utilitarianism, all right, public health crisis, there's all sorts of equities at stake here. What would be the right balance of privacy, but you know, we wanna stop a spread and how could we keep the names for a little while, but then after two weeks, they go away, et cetera, et cetera. That discussion so far we found had been entirely forestalled by those privacy axioms so that you end up with something that as a um, elegant advance in computer science, cool exposure notification using low energy Bluetooth so that you never have to know where people are. You only have to know who they were briefly near. Really cool, but not necessarily integrable or useful to the public health methodologies existing or to which it could evolve to actually assist in contact tracing. And here in October of 2020, my best sense from um, uh, what we've, we've been studying is that so far these exposure notification systems have had nominal, negligible 
impact on the spread of uh, the pandemic, even in areas where there's been something more than no uptake. And that's, you know, really disappointing. So uh, that was our next step. And then we found ourselves as a group receding from exposure notification and how might that framework be used and apps get built on that framework. The reason why is it an app model so that Google and Apple don't have to take responsibility. They can blame the app makers if something goes wrong with their uh, baseline system. And then the apps get approved by public health authorities. But whatever that uh, original system was, we found ourselves then backing off to just sort of back-end assistance to existing contact tracing. I was amazed to understand what the public health folks have known for a long time, which is that the state of the art of contact tracing often involves a fax machine. I, I don't know how many students are familiar with fax machines. They're basically waffle irons with telephones attached to them. And you shove paper through it, and it kind of makes a copy of the paper on the others. It's very strange. And that's how data was getting pushed around among public health establishments. And at that point, figuring out the right massive contract to let to some kind of technology company, I don't know, call it Palantir, in order to help uh, do the back end computational stuff needed just to keep track of who you've called and what they told you if you're a contact tracer doing an interview, that turns out to be a big issue. And even ultimately how to make contact tracing work across state lines. I mean, it's not as if somebody who lives in Connecticut and works in New York or something, who does the contact tracing? There's a super spreader event in the Rose Garden of the White House. Is the District of Columbia supposed to do that? Or Bethesda, Maryland, or Arlington, Virginia, where everybody retired to after that event? I mean, again, you would think these are very basic things that could be worked out for which people in good faith are struggling to work them through with less than help. We fell back from that then to just testing. Because if you don't have a lot of testing, it's really hard to get contact tracing stood up. Because yes, you can try to um, quarantine part of the TTSI uh, initiative that Safra pioneered, but you still want people ideally to be able to test so that the quarantine doesn't have to be maybe the full two weeks if you get a negative test in the meantime, that you can do sentinel testing. I mean, one of the statistics, uh, Dr. Pordeaux might have pointed this out uh, in the prior session, when looking, say, at Massachusetts's success is, yes, there's a surfeit now of contact tracing in Massachusetts. There's idle contact tracers. But how many of the contact tracers, uh, the cases that are contact traced, actually are because they were caught by other contact tracing? How much stuff is out there that's never even being fed into the contact tracing network? Without testing, you can't answer that question very effectively. And even with it, you might discover a lot of people who are testing positive, but weren't reached by contact tracing, even though they must have caught it from somebody. And unless they were outside Massachusetts, you would have liked it to have been the result of contact tracing that they were found. Um, the absence of a nationwide testing strategy has been a disaster. And uh, Massachusetts has been largely spare thanks to the Broad Institute. I mean, thanks to one setup where a bunch of labs could be reconfigured to doing testing, uh, that's helped Massachusetts. But there's been no sort of overall, how do we allocate one to the other? We found ourselves then falling back from testing just to things like masks. People are not necessarily down with wearing masks. And at that point, you realize that this is not so much a technical issue. It's not even so much a public health uh, policy issue as it is a leadership issue. And if your leadership is not even trying, and then taking the not even trying, I mean national leadership here, and then post hoc applying the herd immunity label to the not trying, well, that's the name for not trying called herd immunity. That is incredibly difficult to establish then as a response. And I join my colleagues in the props that they are giving to our local state and local public health establishments that are trying to step up to fill the void. But one of the reasons maybe in Professor Mukherjee's chart about the US was supposed to be at the top of that chart, you know, the big old American flag up there. Whoa, what's going on? Why is the US not actually managing this crisis so well? You know, there's just a massive hole in the donut here. Um, I want to just very briefly mention 
there's some great questions lurking here about the role of academia in assisting here. And um, uh, Professor Allen mentioned, uh, it's amazing what you can get done without credit. So I want to give uh, her credit that she won't take on her own. That SOFRA roadmap to pandemic resilience was a kind of energizing, synthesizing moment in the public eye and among the various people trying to help and figure out how to coordinate. And the fact that that roadmap wasn't uh, fully taken up as she told in the story is just astonishing. And on testing, uh, I was working with some folks wondering, should we do an open letter on testing? And this gets uh, a little bit to um, Professor uh, Mukherjee's point about when should one be working with the establishment to coax it into action and to make it feel safe so that it can then help others versus when is it time for oppositional sort of outrage, political mobilization, come on already, do something. And I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I was fascinated to see, I was thinking, well, what if we didn't do an open letter as in a demand petition.org kind of letter, but just a kind of send us in coach letter hey, governors, whether you're Republican or Democrat, here's a bunch of scientists and public health experts and technology people. We are ready and we'll even bring some money. We've got foundations lined up to help. Just send us in. And the political analysis that I and others heard from people wiser than we were on this was, no, no, you don't understand. Scientists in particular and academics in general are already seen as toxic. If you have a letter signed by a bunch of people that say professor or that end in MD or PhD or JD, uh, any of that stuff, then that letter is going to be seen as a threat by roughly half of the political establishment, regardless of what it says. And I got to say, that was news to me. I, I didn't realize that there's no authority at this point in contemporary American politics in 2020 at the federal level and to some extent at the state level that can kind of be either above it all or maybe the better phrase for it is adjacent to the political fight and kind of some aspect of being the refs or just orthogonal to um, what's going on in the political sphere. And uh, that's why so far as you've heard in our session, it's less than about the details we probably would love to be talking about, you know, the polling. Do I have privacy concerns? Of course I do about contact tracing apps. Well, let's talk through what would it mean to assuage them enough to not only have people comfortable using the apps, but to make it not opt in, but mandatory because we've put the privacy concerns to rest. Your phone is gonna be doing this. And instead of talking about that, we find ourselves really talking about the leadership issues here and what to do on that front. So um, I end only with an apology to you, our students, that your country is failing you. And um, the only silver lining in the most direct sense is that this particular disease appears to spare the young. So I guess you're not bearing directly the costs of that uh, absence, statistically speaking, but indirectly, of course, it's touching everybody. Uh, and um, that's really too bad. Thanks, Professor Zitrain. Um, this has just been a remarkable group of presentations in my mind and each coming at this crucial problem in somewhat different ways. Um, and yet all with the notion of the possibility of this moment and many of the disappointments. Um, I have to say one theme of the course has been that when you have a major pandemic like this, you will expose all of the core social, structural, political, cultural problems of the time. And so one really sees, you know, in all of your cases, the desire to utilize knowledge to address a global crisis and the difficulty of doing that. I, I, I guess I would say 
you know, one of the ways that we often think about this, and this relates very closely to Dr. Mukherjee's presentation, is that we often know what to do. And we often have very strong evidence and evaluation of what to do and even how to do it. And then we come to understand that the obstacles are incredibly diverse and difficult. And in some ways, you know, one of the imaginations of modern technical biomedicine is that we develop specific treatments for specific diseases, we give them to people and they get better. But what we know um, is that even when we have great treatments, we have difficulty getting them to the people who need them most. And so what is this gap? And I think that all of you in different ways have exposed a very powerful translational transitional gap is that even when we have really good knowledge and we've studied it and we've been conscientious and um, developed interdisciplinary or interdisciplinary relationships, it's very hard to convert these insights and technologies, if you will, into um, addressing an epidemic in a timely and systematic and effective way. So I think in some ways, a lot of my questions turn on that. One of the things that Professor Allen said was that the administration and public health really turn from the idea of mitigating the pandemic and balancing the human costs to a vaccine strategy. And I think what we're seeing in the course is that even if you have effective vaccines, it's going to be enormously difficult to deliver them in a socially optimal, ethical way. And there will be tremendous public suspicion about when to take it, how to take it. So even that biomedical approach, which is very instrumental, we're seeing is subject to many of the forces mm -hmm. that the three of you have spoken to today. So just with those thoughts in mind, I don't know if you have anything you wanna say, but please do, and we'll open it up to some student questions now. Yeah, I, I'd just love to comment on your uh, comments and you know, thank you, Jonathan and Danielle. It's really on, an honor to be on this panel with you. You're both amazing thinkers. And I, you know, I think that one of the things I've observed and that we, you know, cannot underestimate is that the leaders that are approaching this from the perspective of love and compassion and solidarity versus some kind of, you know, brutal ignorance and racism and otherism are the ones who have been successful. And, you know, I can, you know, I think Governor Baker has led with an incredible amount of compassion and understanding that you're going to have to take some risks to do the right thing. But similarly, you know, Ross Baraka, the mayor of Newark, has given some of the most compelling speeches that I've heard during this era, saying, you know, my people of Newark, um, you know, we're not going to be under the same uh, lockdown as the, you know, Montclair County, a rich county in New Jersey, because we've been victims of redlining, social injustice. And when Rutgers wanted to, you know, do vaccine testing, he was very reluctant as a mayor because he understood the level of suspicion going back a lot, you know, to your work, Alan, and Tuskegee. Um, in a m predominantly black city like Newark. So I think as we think about building bridges, part of the politics um, is really how do we replace this uh, notion of law and order, deserving and non-deserving, good citizens and not good citizens with the notion of care and uh, trust, building trust. And I, you know, I've seen now across the US and across the world leaders uh, doing that. And I think it's a just completely different landscape. I think that's a crucial point. And I have to say, you know, 
you and your colleagues at Partners in Health developed strategies that centered on caring and they're effective, but the resistance and the difficulty of doing that remains substantial. So um, I did find you know, that glimmer of sunlight in your talk because I think that where we can arrange things to center on a respect for social and cultural values and the idea that people want good treatment, we can be more successful. But at the same time, you know, I am struck that when you put the United States at the top of everyone that would could respond to um, a emergency pandemic crisis, I do think that I would have been suspicious about that because mm -hmm. we've underfunded public health for generations and the structures that you want to rely on, what really means preparedness is not knowing which bug is gonna be the next one, but do you have the structures in place to really know here's what we need to do, here's what we do. And that's been tremendously problematic for the, at least the U.S. experience. And, and, and do you have the moral foundation? I mean, I, and I think this is to what Jonathan said, and I'll, I won't take all the time, but, you know, this is where I think we need to hold academia responsible for the silos that we operate in because that pandemic preparedness is, you know, a set of principles that's laid out, but it's exclusively from a public health, um, you know, lens without looking at political economy, without looking at social theory or history. And so to me, we have a responsibility as academics to work across those lines, but those are not necessarily the lines on which we're evaluated and all of these things. So we've set up a system by which we are, I think, echoing some of these really flawed pedagogy. 